the new way everyone is getting their cell service. No overage penalties, great rates, keep what you do not use, no contracts, and someone will actually pick up the phone when you need support. Use our link and get $25 off your first month's service or your new phone. Just go to tech-zen.tv slash ting to save $25. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Make It. This is episode number 25 and this week I'm here with Bob again and this week we're going to talk about how to make a thermostat and we're going to show it to you uh, in two different kinds of temperature sensors. Uh, Bob did the most popular one probably and then I took the temp temperature sensor that I did in the sensor episode and integrated it into a thermostat and so we're going to show you two different ways of doing that. Uh, throughout the two different segments of the show. And this week we're going to get started uh, with Bob. But before we do that, let's make sure we say hi to Bob. Hello, Mike. All right. How you doing? I'm good. How have the storms been down there this year? Uh, well, the uh, tornadoes were tough uh, a month ago. Not as bad as Oklahoma, but, you know, we had a few around here. And But it's it's Texas in the summertime, so it was, I think we hit 100 today, so not bad. Oh, yeah, it's not too bad. And, no. know, it's not quite summertime yet, but it's quite so dry either. I just yeah, thought it was not, cool. not, not yet. Yeah, I was just wondering about the, the we've had this week storm after storm after storm, you know, it's right in a row, so um, it's like every night we're recording a show, there's a storm around, it seems like, so... All right, so the first thing we want to do, Bob, is we're going to go over and we're going to watch your demo. You, you gave me a video, so I'm going to go ahead and play the video, and we will um, have you kind of... Right. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I've, I, I, have the, I have the circuit set up. Uh, let me switch to it real quick just to show, you know, just, to, just so we can see what's going on. Okay. So I've got the LCD screen, and then this little guy right here that you can hardly see is an LM35 sensor and it reads in Celsius and the code will be, uh, will show that. Um, and then this little connection right here, that right there, that's just for me to disconnect it because in this video that we're going to watch, there is a place where I unplug it so you can check to, the code will check to make sure there's valid data. So that's what that connection is for, and that's the little sensor. And then we just put the, uh, the, the output to the LCD screen, and it's a fairly simple little circuit. And then in your demo, you, you do something with the data as you're reading it. So this is just a demonstration of how to read the LM35. Right. So you want me to go, let's go play the video real quick. So let's, yeah, let's look at the video. And let me hit play. So here we have a little welcome, two little welcome screens. Pretty self-explanatory. And now here it's reading the data. It's, a, it's reading off one of the analog pins. And now I have a little piece of ice that I'm going to put on the, the circuit. And I have to do this quick because I don't want to have it melt and get, uh, get water in my breadboard. But as it cools down, it tells you that it's cold and it's time to turn on the heat. That and then, it, and back then it's back back into normal temperature range. And then here I'm just using my fingers to to heat it up a little bit. Just to show that it you know that it is reading. And then when it gets warm, it says that it's hot and it's time to time to turn the AC on. And then the last piece is where I disconnect the circuit and it warns you. And that blinking is, that's on purpose. And then we're back to normal. And I found it to be, a, you know, I used the setup right out of the Arduino playground and uh, found it to be accurate and correct and uh, actually really easy to use. All right. So yeah, that was all available right off the playground. So nothing really special, and I think nothing want, real special. We want to note kind of in here that this is using just an analog pin. There's no special data calculation, as you know, as far as sending digital data. It's basically reading off an analog pin. Yeah, it's just reading the analog pin, and there's a one little calculation to turn it from the analog reading into a Celsius measurement, and then of course I do a standard uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit mathematical conversion right and there is an lm34 uh 
sensor that does the same thing, only it actually will read the data to you in um, in Fahrenheit. Right. So the one you use to actually reach it to you in Celsius, and you have to convert it to, for Fahrenheit. That's right. All right. So let's go walk through the code. And let's see. We'll scroll down a little bit here. And this, uh, what is this uh, chip cost? About $2, something like that? Um, Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it, a lot less than what was, my digital one cost. Not, yeah, next to nothing. Right. All right, so at the very top here, you're only including two libraries, so it shows you don't need anything special. Just That's the right. liquid crystal and the wire.h, which both control the liquid crystal display. Yeah, and and this uh, this... The liquid crystal library is the same one that we used that, well, it's, it's funny, you and I um, both worked on the SaneSmart LCD screen and episode five, you made some changes to the code and interesting, like I made basically the same changes, um, but I did add one additional function into that library, so where I keep all the code on GitHub has my slightly modified library, um, but it's basically your code plus one function. All right. Uh, because both of us had the same problem um, with the uh, uh, with the same smart code. It just didn't work. So right. we had to modify the library. All right. And we come down and we're setting columns and rows here. That's right. And you're using them right here to set the little crystal to display. Uh, one of the things about the same smart, I think their documentation doesn't say it's 3F, but it is 3F. Uh, if I remember that correctly. And then you set your temperature pin. So you're using analog one as your input for your temperature pin. Right. And I could have used any of the analog pins, and I just, that's where, that's just the one I picked. Right. And no if, you're using, if you're using an Uno, you couldn't, you couldn't have used four and five. Is that correct? Uh, you can, but you have to move. Um, the uh, I'm using the standard uh, library uh, for two standard wire. library for um, for the wire uh, for the for the wire. So you could have reassigned those pins, but I didn't see any reason to, right. so I didn't. Right. All right. So we're going down through setup, and we just do the LCD init. You reset it, turn the light on so we can read it, <laughs> and then That's right. and then we do the initial demo screen, which is the welcome and the the GitHub information that, that that's right then you do the lcd clear and then we come to a funny one so this is one you need to explain because it's something that um you wouldn't have to do but it makes things better right well this is a little piece that i found on the uh on the playground and they said that if if you change the internal reference of the analog pin within the arduino you could get a much more precise measurement off of it. So I made this one little change and and it was and that's exactly what I saw, a much more precise uh, a much more precise reading off the off the sensor. Now the the cost of that was uh, I did lose a little um, uh, range. But since we're you know since this demonstration is based off of a uh, you know, for a for a heater, you know, a he heater, air conditioning unit, a thermostat replacement kind of project, that was actually a good thing. So uh, the reference goes from zero to 110 degrees. Okay, and if it's that cold or warm in your house, you have other problems. <laughs> you have some. Uh, you have some other problems. That's right. All, right. All right, and then we come down into the actual loop function, and. Uh, you define some variables. I assume loop delay is your delay that you're waiting in the loop. It makes sense, yeah. right? As this runs, it's just it's checking the the sensor once it, once every second. All right, and then you define the reading variable and two temperature variables. One looks like a, it would be Celsius, and one in Fahrenheit. And uh, I do want right. to note that you have them floats, not ints, because they yeah, have decimal you, places in them. That's right. If you change it to uh, the integer, then you just get uh, whole numbers and you lose the decimal place, which um, kind of defeated the purpose of going to a more precise measurement. Right. All right. Then here comes the actual work we're going to do, right? Right. That's it. <laughs> and so we have one, we, we grab the reading off the, off the analog pin 
And this, this formula right here is straight off the Arduino playground where we take the reading and divide it by 9.31. All right. Was there any description of why 9.31 in there? Uh, they, there is a ca they they show the calculation and how they okay. arrived at that calculation. I did not put that explanation here. That's fine. So if you, if you're interested in knowing why, go to the Arduino Playground, and they'll explain why. That's right. And this number was different depending on which reference you're using. Correct. That's right. So the internal reference number is 9.31. If it's not internal referenced, then there's another number you put in there. Yeah, yeah. If you if you don't use this, um, if I remember right, it was five volts times the reading, times one hundred, and whatever the product of that that multiplication is, you divide it by ten twenty four, and that gives you the temperature in sensor, uh, in Celsius. Okay. If you so you could use this sensor with three point three volts, and then you could simply change the formula and get a accurate reading again. All right. And then you convert the Celsius to Fahrenheit. I mean, this is a yeah. very commonly known calculation. Standard, yeah, standard calculation. And there's a couple ways people have done this. So um, I've seen 9 divided by 5 times temp in, temp in times 9 divided by 5, like you did it. Uh, and then you got to add 32. It all, yeah. it all comes out the same. That's right. right. All right. And then we come down and we have some debugging code in here. And then we go... Yeah. So you're validating you have a valid reading. So you just mentioned about the reading being 0 to 110, but you have it here as 307. The, the, the value off the analog pin, according to the documentation, will range from 0 to 307. Right. So and you within remember, that range, right. you'll get the 0 to 110 degree range of temperature. But the analog pin is going to show those values. So here I just make sure that I'm within what is supposed to be the correct okay the correct range of data and then if I and if I'm not then it pops up this this message okay that, 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 you know so I so I check it and then I do something right and this is where you showed in your video about it flashing because you unplugged it so when you That's unplugged right. it do you know what value it was sending when I, I was debugging this, I got values in the tens of thousands. Okay, so it's definitely not anything close to this. Completely, com yeah, completely out of range. Right. All right. And if it's out of range completely, you basically are blinking the display. You see here, you're turning it off and back on. That's right. Yeah. Turn it up. Turn off the black backlight. Turn back on the backlight and show the message that it's invalid data. And I completely avoid the portion of the code where I'm doing something with the temperature. Right. All right. And you do that, uh, how many times do you do that? Oh, you, you do well, I'm looping through the, I'm looping through this, yeah, once a second. Right. I gotcha. All right. And if the data is good, then you're going to set your cursor and say the current temperature is... And you're going to display it in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. That's right. And I I kind of wrote this out in a in a long way just to just to show how all the pieces were being put together. Uh, the the char two twenty three, um, that's actually the character for a degree symbol. All right, that's good to know. And so you could this could have been written in a much more compact way, but I wrote it out on purpose to to show all the pieces all right and then you're checking your temperature and if it's greater than or equal to 82 you're going to say wow it's hot turn on the ac which we saw that in the video when you had your finger on there that's right or yeah when with the finger on there that's right and then when i had the ice on there then uh, it got below 68 and told you that it was cold and turn on the heat all right and then if it's not either one of those two, here you're doing the clear row function to clear out the, the text that's on there. And that's basically just because if the text has been left from one of those other messages, right, it stays there. I, I want the, I, yeah, it's not going to get cleared off unless I specifically tell it. So, so every place where you've got, you know, something with the temperature, that's where you would do something, and you're going to show that in your code right. later on. Right. All right, and then we delay, and we just do the loop delay. And then repeat it again. And do it all over again. Right. And so um, at the very bottom, you have your initial demo screen, which basically shows what we had on the screen. 
the uh, sensor demo as seen. Let's make it. You wait for five seconds, and then you do the link to GitHub, and then you are done. And then you've right. you've created these other functions to make it uh, easy to center things in the so print centered basically takes the length one divides it by two, uh, and then uh, smooths it left that many times basically, and then puts the text out to the screen. I think we've talked about these functions before at some other point. Yeah these these are these are convenience functions that I wrote for the for an LCD screen which just prints something centered printed you know, right justified, left justified, uh, j just make it a, a little, you know, my code a little more compact because you see I wrote, um, you know, t those two screens with basically, uh, you know, less than 10 lines of code total. Right. So uh, they're just convenience functions and they're actually part of something else that I'd written elsewhere. And that's why I had to include my library with the one additional function, or you know, your library with the one additional function added. All right. Yeah, to to be compatible with with my with this LCD code. But really, an, reading the analog pin, really all it is is three lines of code in here. Right. You so know, the rest setting, of the stuff just does display. More that's than right. Anything. You, you set the internal reference, you read the analog pin, you make one calculation, now you've got a temperature. All right. And then here's the clear row, and that's it. That's where the bottom of the code. That's right. All right. So uh, before we jump into the next uh, segment, we want to remind you that uh, we are moving our YouTube uh, channel to one big channel for the whole Texan TV network. So if you've been watching us on YouTube, uh, I've been telling you, I'm going to keep reminding you of this for the next couple of weeks yet still, that we are uh, moving all the videos. So they only will be on the new YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. So if you've been watching us on the uh, Let's Make It channel, you need to go to youtube.com slash Texan TV and subscribe over there because we'll start putting these shows over there only in the next couple of weeks. So you don't want to get lost. Make sure you go do that uh, right now. Just a real quick reminder that I wanted to bring up. Now, we also had um, a viewer question this week that uh, Bob has worked up a little uh, presentation to explain what it is. So we basically had somebody want to know what forward voltage is and you hear us talk about that. And so Bob's going to go through and he's going to uh, show us uh, and explain to us what forward voltage is. So let me go ahead and um, get this up here. And we'll let Bob uh, go ahead. So forward voltage is what we're talking about. So this is forward voltage, and this is a question from viewer named Matt. So thank, thank you, Matt, for bringing this up. Um, the, the, def, the, the basic definition of forward voltage is that it is the minimum voltage that you need to light an LED. And so if you've got an LED that, and we're gonna use this in an example in a couple, here in just a moment, where the LED is a three volt forward voltage uh, device. Well, if you supply that LED with two volts, you're not gonna have any light. You have to get past the three volts. Uh, the other nice thing about it, which is, actually very convenient, is that LEDs, the voltage uh, does not change with temperature. So the fo forward voltage is very con constant across a temperature range, which makes uh, uh, using LEDs very easy. So, so why is forward voltage important? And this will, will actually get to the problem that we were talking about last week. Um, we need the forward voltage to make sure that we give the um, the LED the correct amount of current because in any LED you've got to have a resistor, otherwise you blow out and burn out your LEDs. And as much as I like the smell of burnt electronics, it is something that I try not to do. Um, but we need to know the forward voltage, what the maximum current of the LED is, and of course we need the supply voltage. So here we have one little LED, and this we're going to see this LED here in just a second. Uh, it's a it's one that I have sitting around, and it's spec'd at three volts and twenty milliamps. And we're going to just use Ohm's law to calculate 
the correct resistor. And the calculation is fairly straightforward and uh, it's, it's right there. So in this case, we need a 100 ohm resistor to make sure that we stay at 20 milliamps. Um, and as long as we use something 100 or greater, then we don't have to worry about burning out our LED because if the resistance is greater, then the current is lower. Okay, before we go to the next page, can we talk a little bit about Ohm's Law? Because um, I just want to make sure that people that are watching the show that aren't necessarily into electronics but more into making things like you know Arduino-type projects understand a little about Ohm's Law. Um, I don't want to go into great detail, but it's basically the combination of three things that always equal each other. Yes, the the whatever the current is times whatever the resistance is is going to give you the voltage. And and in this case, we've rearranged the formula, so we want to calculate the resistance. So we're going to take whatever the supply voltage is and we're going to subtract whatever the forward voltage is. And then we're going to divide that by the current and in this case, it's the spec maximum current. And, and of course, we have to, th these calculations are all done. We can't use, we can't just put in 20 and have it work. It's got to be, um, it's got to be in amps, not in milliamps. And that gives you, that calculation will give you the, the 100 ohms. So, yeah, Ohm's Law, it's, uh, if, you're, if you're doing anything in electronics, then Ohm's Law, you're going to run into it all the time. You just, you it's it's the most basic uh, function uh, in electric in right. electricity. And if you don't know what it is, you probably should go out and look it up because it's definitely an important thing to know. That's right. You've you've got you've got to know it. All right. So we'll go on here now. So here I just I made a small little circuit, um, and since we talk about Arduinos here, I I I'm going to use an Arduino and. Really, all I'm doing is nothing more than using it to supply current to an LED. But I wanted it, you know, I did want to put it out, you know, show the schematic and the what it looks like on the breadboard. All right. And then this next page, the, the, the first uh, picture you see in the upper right, I've got my uh, little multimeter there. And I've switched it to check for resistance, and my 150 ohm resistor is actually reading 146.1. And then just to double check my this demo, I, I check my power supply off the Arduino, and I'm getting the 4.69 volts. And th this Arduino, th this is actually you know something that's nice to know about an Arduino is that. Uh, this is plug that's plugged into a USB port right there. And you're not going to get, you know, even though the pin says five volts, you're not going to get your full five volts. You're going to lose a little bit in the power conversion within the Arduino. So 469 is, is, is typical, but I did double check my, my voltage. And then the last screen, um, one interesting thing is if you have the LED on, you can check the voltage across the LED. So if you look carefully in that picture, you can see that I've got my pins on, on the LED, and I'm reading a forward voltage of 302. So it's right on spec. So using the, the formula we got before, we can calculate that I'm running 11.4 milliamps through that LED as this picture was taken. Which is definitely in the safe range because 20 is the Which max. Is, that's right. So I used a little higher uh, uh, resistance uh, resistor and, and got a lower, um, a, lo a lower current reading. All right. And that's it. And that's it. So Matt, great question. Thank you. Yeah, keep those kind of Send questions more. coming. We want to make sure that if you have those kind of questions, we love to hear them because uh, we'd like to answer them <laughs> just as much as we like to hear That's them. That's right. So um, thank you, Matt, for asking the question. And if you have questions like that, please do not hesitate um, to let us know. And also, we got an email of some other suggestions for shows. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, it gives us more ideas to things that we can do in, in future shows for you as well. All right. So like I said, I took a slightly different uh, a 
uh, approach to this, and uh, it looks more like a mess than, than what Bob's does, but um, I actually used a digital sensor. So let's go over and we'll show you what I have. So the original request, or we, we got a request, the original thing we wanted to do was, was a thermostat, then we got the request of how to do it via XP. So what you see here is two Arduinos. You see the uh, Arduino up here and an Arduino over here. Both have XBs, and this XB is actually on a breadboard because I needed the pins open so I could get to them. So there's two XBs. These are not connected in any way. They're both connected to a USB power supply only. And we're going to show you how they can communicate with each other. So right now, what you see is um, three lights. When This is a yellow light when it's on, a blue and a red. The yellow light represents a fan, like your, your internal fan on your HVAC unit. Blue represents air conditioning, and red represents heat. And then over here you have three buttons, and red means to turn up the temperature, blue means to turn down the temperature, and white is the mode button. And then this little blue thing right here is the actual temperature sensor, and we just showed this in another episode, I can't remember what episode it was now, with sensors, and it's, uh, it's electronic, it provides both uh, temperature and it provides also humidity. And then you see the display right here, and I'm showing you the current temperature, the current humidity, and right now I have it in heat mode, so the light's turned off. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to a different mode that's cool. And auto is basically hot and heat and cool. And there's a delay here for five seconds, so I, you just don't want to change things around on relays uh, to control your HVAC that real quickly. So there you saw both the fan and the AC, you can barely see is on, but if you cover up the yellow, it's there. Uh, the blue AC is on as well. And you also saw on the remote one, the same thing happened. And this is all done via XP. So in here, you can adjust your temperature. If you want to adjust the you know, temperature down or the heat up a little bit, you can adjust all that stuff here. Um, we can go into just the fan mode. So again, in five seconds, you'll see that uh, the AC should turn off, but the fan will remain on. So let's give it a couple seconds here, and it should come back and turn those off. All right, there you go. So now it's just the fan is on because we're in fan mode. And we go into the next mode. And here we are, cool. So it, we know it's going to be cool with 77 degrees in the room right now, and I have it set for 71. So in five seconds, that should turn on. And there goes the AC. And then we also have heat and I'll go ahead and let the heat come on. The, right now there's no heat to be running um, because the temperature's set at 71 and 77 here, but I'm gonna go and turn it up to make it think it needs to come on. So now everything's off. I'm going to crank up the heat to 79. No, I went to 80, sorry, I went to one too far. That's okay. It'll still turn on the heat. There we go. So now we have heat and fan turned on. Now I don't have an LED for emergency heat, but this the code does have the ability to support emergency heat. And there's you know as a pin I haven't hooked up. I haven't done that. And we're going to go to the next mode, which is options. So the only option I have really set in here is I can do both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Right now you see it's in Fahrenheit. So when it's in options mode, these two buttons change the mode. So I'm going to now put it into Celsius mode. So it's 25 degrees in here, 26 degrees in here Celsius. And I can put it back into Fahrenheit by going doing this. So if I leave it in Celsius mode and I go to the other the other modes, like auto, for example. Oh, let's go past auto. It's not going to work great. Uh, so we're going into cool mode. And you see it's set for 21 and it's currently 25 in here. So I should still turn on turn on the, uh, the AC. So let's go turn it back to Fahrenheit because... Um, I can't relate to Celsius. <laughs> so there we Come are. Come <laughs> Mike. You don't know your Celsius? I'm, I have something, nothing against it, but just, you know, <laughs> I don't use it enough to be able to relate to it. So that's pretty much the what we did with um, the thermostat like uh, options. And you can see here, everything's happening very quickly between these two. So, um, and it's all done via Zigbee, completely wireless. And depending on what kind of Zigbee, uh, or XB, I'm using XB chips, but whichever, depending which one you have, would determine um, how far it goes. These are not very far. I, I think I've gotten at least 30 feet away, and it worked fine when I was setting it up in here. But I don't know how what the long distance really is. But you can get it with the nice antennas on them if you wanted to go farther. So let's go walk through the code. And I do want to say while I'm getting the code up, there is some concern about this because it's you're actually going to be touching live electricity. 
And uh, you need to be very, very careful when you do that because you can definitely hurt yourself, and we wouldn't want that to happen. Um, we also also want to make sure that you know that um, just because uh, we've shown you this doesn't mean you should do it. <laughs> it's, it's You're totally at your own risk uh, to do it. But you just remember there's, there's the possibility you could either ruin your HVAC system or even hurt yourself, you know, even fatally hurt yourself if you are in the, in the mains area. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through this code. And I put a couple of notes in here, and I've, my brother-in-law is an HVAC guy, and he basically recommended I do not put the color of the wires in here because everybody has different colors of wires. So I'm going to walk through this a little bit. But um, I have noted in here the the wires and what they do. And what I'm probably going to do is, well, red's always the same thing, green's always the same thing. But i um, probably going to take out some of the other ones because depending on uh, who put your system in, they can use different colors. Red's always 24 volts. Green's always the fan. Typically, yellow and white are always the same, but not always. You can't count that. So what he told me to tell everybody was, if you're going to take off your thermostat, it is best to pull it off the wall a little bit, cut the wires that go into the thermostat, and leave them attached to the thermostat so you know what color was used for what. And then just strip the ends off and, and put them into the whatever else you want to connect it to. So the, the pins that you have, you have the 24 volt feeds, you have um, a wire for st first stage cooling, which is pretty much all most homes have. They don't have a second stage, but basically if the 24 volts is fed and attached to this wire, which is typically yellow, um, the cooling system will start. Now, like I said, most homes don't have a second stage, but commercial cooling systems sometimes do have a second stage. So it's something to, to remember there. And then we have another one for the fan. And again, this is typically green. It's pretty consistently green. And if you add 24 volts, it touch 24 volts and clo contact closure over to the, uh, that wire, it turns the internal fan on. So that's why you see two of my lights coming on together, because if you're running AC, you need the fan. Otherwise, you're not going to be just not moving the, the stuff around. And then we have a wire for first stage heating. And again, uh, most things, most places don't have second stage heating. Uh, and that's your commercial. So if you send 24 volts down that wire, the heat, the system will come on and it will um, turn on the heating. And then uh, there is another wire for second stage if you have second stage, because then uh, unless you're commercial, most places don't have second stage. And second stage uh, is not emergency heat. There's actually a separate wire for emergency heat. Uh, in the case that you have like a heat pump, you would have an emergency heat wire for that. So the next two are actually heat pump only wires. One of them is for uh, reversing a uh, reversing valve when you're running AC. And basically, if you are running a heat pump, you need to tell the outside unit which direction the Freon should be flowing. And these reversing valves do that. Now, there's some sometimes you have a um, a wire for reversing valve for both cooling and for heating. But more often than not these days, you only have one for cooling. So it assumes you're heating unless you energize that wire for cooling, and then it reverses the valve. Um, some systems still do have two wires, but uh, not many. And uh, OK, let's go down a little bit here. I defined how I use the pins. Um, and there's one thing we're going to get down here a little bit. You're going to see I use input pull up. And I'll explain why I do that when I get, get down to there. So here you see the pins I'm using. Um, the Zigbee is using the uh, transmit and receive pins. The uh, pin number three goes to the temperature down. Pin number four goes to temperature up. And uh, pin five goes high when the fan should run. Pin six goes high when AC is calling. Seven goes high when heat is calling. Eight goes high when emergency heat is calling. And then pin number nine connects to the mode button. And the temperature sensor itself is actually on pin number 11. Again, I want to remind you that this is, could be very dangerous if you're actually touching your HVAC system. It is live. You could hurt it or yourself. And let's see, come on down here. So I included the same two libraries that Bob had in his, the wire and the crystal. That's how we're controlling the LCD display. But I have one more. This sensor I'm using actually has a library out in the play playground. Um, it's called D, it's DHT11, which is basically a one-wire interface to a temperature sensor. So we include that. And then we're going to set some of our defaults for a thermostat. So a few things. Um, when it first starts up, it's going to come up with a cool temperature of 72 and a heat temperature of 70. So you see my two defaults right there. 
And then I have this minimum and max. So I have a minimum cool temperature. The coolest you can make it is 60. It will never let you make it any colder than 60. And it won't let you make it any hotter than 85. So here's your my max heat temp, which you'll see that in the code where I check for that. And then I have emergency heat degree. So what this is, is if I see that your temperature is set for 75 and it reaches 72 in your, in your house, I'm going to turn on emergency heat because I don't think that the heat's working properly or it's not working efficiently because it's too cold outside. So that's an automatic thing. And so you don't have to go into emergency heat mode. If you don't want to, it'll take care of it on, on its, uh, by itself. And then we have a run mode and then we have our measurement mode. So uh, measurement mode equals false is actually equal to um, Fahrenheit. It's equal to true, it's equal to Celsius. And then we come down and I have a couple of things I use. You'll see these variables throughout the code that uh, I'm using to keep track of things. And I'm going to explain a little bit more what, what I do with waiting loop and why I do that down a little bit later. Here I'm defining the pins and I mentioned, I call these out above. So mode, temperature up and down, fan, run pin, AC run pin, and heat run pin, and then the emergency heat run pin. I have six modes defined. So my maximum mode is equal to six. I have auto, fan, cool, heat, emergency heat, and options. And probably the one I should have added and I didn't is off because there's no easy way to turn off the lights except for a set or something and just the temperature. Okay, so liquid crystal. Uh, right here is the define the, the display. I'm defining the temperature sensor right here. And we come down here, we attach the temperature sensor to pin number 11. And I'm going to set these pin modes uh, here for all the different things. And I mentioned input pull up. So the reason I'm doing this is when you press the button, it's actually connecting it to ground. So I want an internal pull up resistor attached to this pin so that it reads true unless you're pressing the button then it reads false as a return and you'll see that in my code when i get down there a little bit then i have the lcd init and the turn the backlight on and then serial begin is set up that's how i'm communicating through the zigbee is 9600 baud from to the other remote side all right so now we come down to the working loop and the first thing i'm going to do is check the mode button so if the mode button is not true, which means it's been, it's actually pressed because I'm taking it to ground and it's coming back as a logic zero. Then I, the button was pressed and here's where waiting loop comes in. So the whole idea of the waiting loop is you don't want to make changes immediately when somebody's pressing the button. If you're scrolling through the different modes or changing temperature, you don't want to pass by the value where it should have turned something on and then pass by where it turns it something off. You don't want to turn things off and on really fast. So what I do in the waiting loop is I set this back to zero saying a button was pressed. And then I start my waiting time over again so that you have time to make changes to the thermostat before it makes any decisions what to do with the temperature. So that's the first thing I do here. And then I come down here and you see I clear out these areas. And the reason I clear out these areas is depending what mode you're in, certain things will change. And it's just, there's, it looks funny if you don't clear out the area because what's coming in can be shorter or longer than what was in there before. And then I increase my mode by one. Like I said, we have six run modes to find under max modes. So if my mode goes over the maximum, I go back to the beginning, which is zero. And the zero is the automatic mode. And then in the temperature up button, again, a button was pressed. I'm going to set my waiting loop back to zero. And if I'm in run mode five, which this is the options mode, I'm going to change my measurement mode to true, which means I set it to Celsius. And I'm going to, at that time, also take and blank out the area where the temperature is because Celsius is typically shorter uh, um, than what the Fahrenheit numbers are. And if it's not in mode five, I'm going to go and I'm going to increase the temperature. And the reason I'm calling a function you'll see later is I'm setting the, I'm increasing the temperature for the mode that I'm in. So rather than putting all the logic here saying what mode am I, I, am I in, I just do it one place later on. And then we do the temperature down button, which basically does the exact opposite of the temperature up button. Um, if it's not run mode five, we decrease the temperature. And again, we call another routine to determine what mode you're in and what gets changed. And if you are in run mode five, then we're going to set it back to Fahrenheit and clear out the area again. And then we come down and we actually get to do the work. So here we basically are reading the values from the digital chip right here. So this sets the CHK is the return. Basically it's a, it's a status return. And 
I come down here and I say, if a status is equal to zero, that means that everything was good. I got back data, no problem. So if I'm okay and everything's good, I'm going to set the cursor, uh, print out the word temperature, and depending on what measurement mode is set, I'm going either going to display uh, the temperature, and you see this is actually a structure, so it's you know actually like a, um, a library function or a library value, and so I'm going to display the temperature and put the little C after it. And if it's not in uh, Celsius mode, I'm going to call a function called Fahrenheit, which takes this temperature value in Celsius and converts it to Fahrenheit for us. So there's no calculations needed um, to generate the Fahrenheit. I'm storing the current temperature, because I use this later, as, uh, as Fahrenheit. So everything I do internal to this is done in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. So that's something else to kind of remember as well. So I set the cursor, I am going to display humidity, and I am going to do uh, the DHT11.humidity, which is a value set in the class, and a percent sign. I'm going to set the cursor, say what mode I'm in, and here I'm doing is printing out the modes uh, array that we saw above. And then there's a function called current settings, and I'm going to walk through that. This was just an easy way of doing uh, a little, little bit cleaner way of handling that. Now, like I said, a zero means that there was no error, but it does send back error codes. So if you're having problems with this chip, you can uncomment this area, and this will actually print on the screen what error code the chip is sending you. Uh, typical ones are timeout uh, and checksum errors. All right, so here we're going to display in the waiting loop. So the whole idea of the waiting loop is to wait five seconds. So you'll see right here, I delay 200 milliseconds for every time I check the button read. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting for 25 cycles, which is basically five seconds uh, to take action. So the take, the take action we're going to walk through here shortly as well is where it goes and looks and says, what do I need to be doing right now based on what the settings are? But I don't want to do this um, if the button was recently pressed. So that's why we keep saying waiting loop back to zero. And then I delay my 200 milliseconds, which is five times a second, and uh, go back into loop and do that all again. Now, one of the things you may have noticed is sometimes the button's a little slug sluggish. You could make this a little bit faster. It's a little bit faster. Uh, it seemed fine for what I was doing, but uh, maybe a little bit faster would be a little bit more responsive. Just remember if, that if you do that, you want to like change this waiting loop count right here so that it still waits the five seconds. All right, so here's current settings. What this basically is going to do is return, based on the mode, what the current settings are uh, on the thermostat. So I'm defining some variables right here. And depending on the measurement mode, I'm going to uh, set a variable that's going to be displayed. So if it's equal to Celsius, I take uh, the cooling and the heating temperature both, and I do the calculation. This is what Bob did this 5 divided by 9 calculation. This is another way of doing it as well. Um, and then you can, uh, if, if it's not and it's Fahrenheit, I'm going to come down and store that. Like I said, I store everything in Fahrenheit in the, in the program. And then I come down to run mode, and if I'm in run mode auto, I'm going to print out um, at sign, and then the cool temperature, a slash, and the warm temperature. If I'm in the fan mode, I'm not printing anything. I'm just saying fan. And so I just send out, I said I return basically um, uh, blank. And then if I uh, am in cool mode, I'm just going to display you want temperature. So it's going to be the at sign and the temperature setting. And if I'm in heat mode, I'm going to show you the heat, heat temperature as well as heat temperature whenever I'm in emergency mode. And in, in the options mode, there's nothing there either. So there's send back blank. So basically what I'm doing is you saw this defined in the very beginning. I'm writing these variable, this variable to this temp temporary variable, and then I'm returning it back to the calling program above. So this does all the work. All right, so let's look at increase set temperature. And you'll see why here in a second, why I broke this out, because all this logic on the top would have been very difficult uh, to follow. So when you call increase set temperature, I look at what mode you're in. So if you're in mode zero, which is the automatic mode, increasing is going to increase the heat temperature. So I increase the heat temperature by one degree for each uh, button press. And if the heat temperature goes over the max heat type, I set it to the value of the maximum heat, heat temperature because you can't go above the max. If you're in mode uh, two, which you notice I skipped mode one because there is no temperature setting in the fan mode. If you're in mode two, you're in the cool. So I'm going to increase the cool temperature by one degree. And I'm going to compare that to the maximum heat temperature. I'm going to use that same uh, maximum heat 
number to make the maximum for the cooling as well. And if it's greater than I set it to the maximum right there. And then we come down to mode three and it's heat temp. It's a record in regular heat. So I uh, increase the heat temperature. And again, I check and see if it's over the maximum heat temperature. And I do the same thing for emergency heat. It can't go over the maximum heat as well. And you notice there's no mode five because there's no options uh, needed for that. And the decrease the temperature does the exact opposite. So you see here in, uh, in automatic mode, it's uh, a degree down, takes the temperature for cool down one degree. And we check that here. And then mode two decreases the cool temperature by one degree. And if you're in mode three or four, you decrease the heat temperature by one degree. And you see here, I'm looking at the minimum cool temperature. That's our range. We can't go below that. All right, so here is what I consider the probably pretty much the workhorse of this program. So you saw me call this take action routine. And what this does is it determines what to do based on the current mode and the current temperature. So if we're in automatic mode and the current temperature is less than the heat temperature, then I'm going to basically do, some, do something with heat. But the first thing I want to do before I do that is I want to try to compare the current temperature to the heat temperature setting minus the, in my case, three degrees set at the top. And if that is the case, I'm going to call a routine called turn on. So turn on turns on four things. It turns on either fan, AC, heat, or emergency heat. So in the case that is three degrees colder than what my current heat temperature is set to, I'm going to turn emergency heat on. So I turn the fan on. I don't turn the AC on or the heat on. Then I turn the emergency heat on. So you see fan and emergency heat are turned on. If it's within that three degrees, so we're still in that, in that okay area, I'm going to turn on heat, uh, fan and heat, just regular heat. So you see a true, false, true, false. And then if that's not the case, so it's not, it's not time for heat, not time for heat. So we're going to come down here and we're going to see is the current temperature greater than what we had the, the AC set to. So if it's greater than the cool temperature, I'm going to turn on the fan and the AC. And if none of these conditions are true, which means we are in the good range, we don't need to be cold or heated, I'm turning everything off. So fan off, fan off, fan off, and fan off. If I'm in fan mode, there's only one thing I got to do. There's no thinking about it. I just turn this fan on. Everything else goes to false because I'm in fan only mode. In uh, AC mode, you come down here, and if the current temperature is greater than the cool the cool temperature, then we're going to turn on the fan in the AC. And if it's not, we're all good. We're going to turn off everything. So we're turning off everything right there. Then we come down to heat, and again we're going to check the heat temperature. If it's colder than what the thermostat set to for heat then we're going to do some work. So we, before we do that, we determine, is it three degrees colder or whatever the emergency heat degree is set to um, than the current temp is in the current setting? And if it is, we're again, we're going to go into emergency heat. So we have fan and emergency heat. And if it's not, we're just going to do regular heat. And so we have fan and regular heat. And if we're warmer or as warm as we're supposed to be, we turn everything off. So we do false across the board. And when you get to emergency heat, there's no comparing anything. Basically, if it's colder than what it's set to, we turn on emergency heat and fan. Otherwise, we turn it all off. And then the default is to turn everything off right here. If, the, if something would happen in your program that it was not one of the right modes, this would basically say, I don't want to do. I'm turning everything off. So that's the workhorse. So the next thing we want to do is we want to look at the, uh, the turn on. And basically, I'm passing in integer. Or, uh, yeah, they're integers. They could have been booleans too. I probably could make it a little bit less memory usage if I would have done that. But you see I'm passing in fan, AC, heat, and emergency heat. And you see um, I'm adding this, I have this variable called run total. Now, the one thing I need to explain is in this program, in this routine, we're actually sending out the data for the remote as well. So before I walk through this, let's explain that protocol just a little bit. It's a very simple protocol. Uh, the format is basically this. There is a, a preamble of two X's, and then there's either ones or zeros for the next four characters, which determine if the fan, AC, heat, or emergency heat are on or off. Then there's a, uh, a Y, which is the, um, the stop, and then there's a checksum, and then there's a Z for a terminator. So you should always get something that's XX and then either zero or ones, a Y, another number, and then the Z. This other number is a checksum, and the way it's done is each of these positions has a value. So the first position is equal to one, the second position is equal to two, the third one is equal to three, and the fourth one is equal to four. I know not very original, but this works real easily. 
and whichever ones are turned on, you add them together. So if the fan and the AC is on, you're adding one and two so that this checksum will be equal to three. So when I receive this on the receiving side, which we're going to walk through after this program, I compare that to make sure that I'm getting everything in the right format so that I'm not turning something on that shouldn't be turned on because I got garbage. It's another way of checking to make sure that it was it was received properly. So as we walk through this, you see the first thing I do is I send out a preamble. And I check and I see his fan supposed to be on. So if it's supposed to be on, I go ahead and turn the fan pin on. So there I set the fan pin equal to true. And I'm going to send out a one because the fan should be turned on. And my run total is equal now equal to one, which is the, this is the checksum. So the checksum is currently equal to one. And in the case where the fan isn't supposed to be running, it comes down here and it says the pin is off. And I send out a zero because zero means fan, that this function is not running or not, off, not on. Then I come down and check the AC. And again, I turn on the AC pin to true. And then I send out a one because I've already sent out the one or zero for the first one. So now we're in the second one. And my checksum is going to get added to by two now because I'm in the second position. And if it's not uh, on, then I turn off the pin and I send out a zero. Then we come down, we check heat. We do the exact same thing. If heat is um, true, then we turn the pin on high, send out a one for that position. And since it's a one, we add three to the checksum. And if not, we uh, send out a zero and turn the pin off right here. It would do the same thing for emergency heat, exactly the same. You notice run totals equal to four. So I've added up all these run totals to come to the end. Now I send out the Y, which is the, uh, the stop. And then I send out the checksum. And then I send out the terminator right here. And that's it. That's it for the sender. It's um, a little longer. Uh, the one lost off the walkthrough. But what I want to do now is I want to go over and I want to show you the receiving code. It's much, much simpler. Um, than what the sending code is, because uh, it's it basically is getting information back uh, as to do is no decision making on in this one. So um, you see again, we have our pins defined. You notice there's a lot fewer pins. I have a fan, AC, heat, and emergency heat pin. The exact same pins that are on uh, the other sketch. So you can pretty much can take the same uh, connections out of the Arduino as you would for the other program. And here you notice we have a state. So instead of a mode, this one has a state. And we've talked about state machines before, which is kind of what the mode is uh, in the other program. But here we're going to actually going to call it a state machine. And I can't remember what episode I talked about that in. So we have uh, basically uh, five states, and this is all based around the, the protocol. We have a begin, we have a start, we have values, we have a checksum, we have end transmission. Uh, basically, the begin is when I'm looking for the X's to come across for the preamble. After I see an X, um, I'm going to go to the start, and I should see another X. So that's part of the preamble's working. And then after I see the second X, I'm assuming what's coming next is values that I need. So I keep reading values until I get to that Y. When I see that Y, I go into checksum mode. So I'm waiting for my number for a checksum. And then when I see the Z, I know I'm at the end. So these are the, the, the states, and you're going to see how I walk through the states to validate wh where I am through all this. And then here I have some things that I'm uh, using throughout the program, you'll see. And uh, setup's much simpler. Basically, it's four pins set up all to output and serial begin 9600 because I'm receiving my commands via serial port from the XB. All right, so here we come down and we loop. And if you've seen some of the other things I've done with serial use is very similar. I define a input character and I check if data is on the serial port. And if it is, I go ahead and I read it and I stick it into this CH variable. And here comes the state machine. So. If we're in the begin state, what all, all I'm doing right here is looking for an X. So I'm going to keep reading serial data until I see a capital X. When I see the capital X, I'm going to say, okay, I'm starting. So I'm going to set my current state to start and drop out of this uh, case statement. And next time I'm around, it's going to come back in, read another character, and it's going to come down to start. If it's another X, then I'm assuming, okay, we're probably getting ready to go get real data because I've gotten two X's in a row, which is what I'm looking for. So I set my current state uh, equal to values, which is the next thing we're going to do. And I set my value pointer equal to zero, which is basically saying the next thing I read should go into array element zero. And if something happens that I don't get an X, so some we see we're getting garbage, and one of the things that comes across is a capital X in the garbage, and the next thing's not a capital X, I'm going to say that wasn't, that wasn't the beginning. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to start over again and say look for an X for the, to begin with. So if you even if you were sending valid data across and you got an X and some other weird character and then the numbers, it would ignore it because it doesn't know 
it was not positive what it got was correct. So it's going to go back and start over. And then in five seconds, when it sends it again, it'll get the new information. All right, so we come down in, in the values. So we get two X's. We're now in the values. So I'm assuming I'm getting the numbers, the ones and zeros come across. And I'm coming down here. And the first thing I'm going to check for is, am I getting another X? And if I'm getting another X, something's wrong because it shouldn't be getting an X right now. So I'm going to go back and do, do begin. If I get a Z, which is end transmission, uh, something's wrong there too because I shouldn't be getting that. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to start over. And if I get a Y, I assume that I've gotten all the numbers and I'm going to go into check some state. So if none of these conditions are true, so we're still probably getting numbers, I'm coming down here and I'm checking, is it really a number? So is it between zero and nine? And it really should be between zero and one because I'm only really sending over zero and one. So I could tighten this down a little bit and just make that one, make it a little bit cleaner probably, uh, but I'm not going to change it right now. So if it is, I'm going to go ahead and save to the values array, to the value pointer, the character, which is either a zero or one, increase the value pointer. If um, the value pointer goes greater than four, I'm going to start over again because I shouldn't get that many numbers. I know I only have four numbers coming to me. If I get five, something else is wrong. So again, I'm going to start over. It's just another condition that says um, we need something's wrong. We need something you need to start over. So after we do this and we go through this loop and get all four of these, we're going to get this Y at the end. So it should be XX, four numbers, and then, then a Y. So when I get that Y, I'm going to go into checksum mode. So I'll come down here to checksum. And there's basically two things. I'm either going to get a Z or a number. I should get a number first. So hopefully I get a number first. I'm setting the checksum equal to that. And then I get a Z saying it's the end of transmission. And when I get the end of transmission, I basically know I'm at the end. So I go into the end of trans state and I come down. And the next time through, um, basically there's a character turn line feed that follows this. So there will be another character that I've just read in. And it comes down here and it says, is checksum equal to calc checksum? And I'll show you that routine in a second. And if it is, it's assuming that everything that came across was valid. So at that point, I'm basically calling the same turn on uh, routine that we have in the other one with just a few things taken out of it. And I'll show you that in a second as well. But I'm sending it the values that were passed over. So all I'm doing is saying, if the value I got was equal to one, then send true over. Otherwise, send it to false. Um, to the to the turn on value and then I start over again set my state back to begin and I'm back waiting for another X So let's go ahead and look at calc checksum and as I showed you in the other well, one Mike, Mike, I've, Mike, I've got a question for you before sure. you get too far because while I'm while I've been listening to this I've been thinking about well, what happens if you get noise and because you're doing this these are ASCII characters You're sending correct. Yes that are being transmitted. Yep. So to get an X in just random noise, you'd have to get, you know, ASCII characters. There's 128. No. Yes. Yeah, be, no, it's, this it should be. 100, 128 characters in the basic ASCII set. Right. So you'd have to, so you have a 1 in 128 chance of getting a random X, and then the next character, another 1 in 128 random chance of getting a capital X. Right. Correct? Yes. Which and would that, be 16,000, whatever that, what, whatever 128 right. square Right, and then it, it goes farther, then checking if, if I'm getting something other than a letter as well, or a number on the next four. So all of this is making sure that you never get uh, random noise data being transmitted and received uh, in the wrong order, because the odds of getting random noise in the right, in the right, sequence is is virtually well you're more you're probably more likely to win the lottery than yes than yeah. to get this right okay well i just wanted to make sure that uh, that i was understanding and that's good because you've got all these checks you're checking each character you've got to check some because the last thing you want to do when you're receiving the data at at the other end is to end up with wrong incorrect data and turn on and off Something right, exactly. You, you don't want your heater turning on for no reason at all because <laughs> your neighbor turned on the microwave for, you know, whatever. That's right. All right, so let's look at calc checksum. So on the other side, you saw me adding a value of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I'm doing the same thing here, the exception of I'm doing it in a loop. So you see I'm going 0 to 4, and I'm checking if it's equal to 1. And if it's equal to 1, I'm basically adding to the value um, this loop value right here. So that's how I get the total. And then... Um, I return uh, 48 plus. This is how I'm getting it into the ASCII range right there. 
and then we have our turn on routine and this is basically a copy of the other side minus the fact that this side doesn't have the protocol information going out so all i'm doing right here is if fan is on i'm turning the pin true or false depending on what the value of the in the integer is uh same thing with ac heat and emergency heat and that's it this is that's all there is for the remote side now there is um something that i wanted to go back to um the actual Arduino. So I originally was going to do this with relays and I don't have relays to fit my breadboard. So I ended up using LEDs, but you'll see in here that uh, we actually have transistors. And the reason we do this is um, the Arduino can't drive that many relays. There's not enough power for it. So we're using the um, transistors to get around that. Now, I think I actually have uh, a drawing for it. Do I still have it here somewhere? And we'll show you how we actually put that in there. That's something I probably should have mentioned before is you don't want to go directly to the relays. Let's see if I can get it up here quick. I guess it depends on how quick quick is. <laughs> I have this. Yes. Okay, so here's the schematic. Let me go over this. List. Here's the schematic. And uh, you'll see right here we are coming out of the Arduino uh, on these digital pins, and we are going into the base of the transistor. And then we're right now running LEDs, but you could just as easily stick in here uh, a relay, and this would not uh, take the draw or draw too much out of the Arduino. Do you know what the maximum draw is on the Arduino pin? Uh, 50 milliamps, I, if I remember correctly. And yeah, it's a, pretty small. With a with a total of the Arduino... Like 250 or something like that? I think it's 500 you can draw. Uh, it re functionally, it's 450 because if you're running off a USB, you can't run more than 500 milliamps off of a USB hub. So right. you're really, you know, to include some co or some current for the Arduino itself, you're looking at pins with 450 total. Right. So, yeah, we basically would... Um replace these LEDs with relays in the case you want to do that. Now, that was my original intention. I just didn't have uh, relays that would fit. It seemed like my relays are all, um, the way they are laid out with the pins, you either you're crossing, crossing sides or something with them, and it doesn't work right. So I just didn't have a chance to, to get it to work. All right. That's it for that. <laughs> That's good. That's good code. And whether you, you know, my example was just, reading data off the analog pin the you could read off a digital pin analog pin uh the rest of the control for a hva system system is the same of course you you've get you've got to be careful you got to know what you're doing before you right. implement any of anything that we've demonstrated tonight yep be very careful especially when you're if you're working actually in the hvac unit itself because there's some high voltages in there very high voltages all right, so uh, I want to remind you again that our YouTube channel is moving to youtube.com slash TV. If you're watching Let's Make It, go there now. I mean, we're at the end of the show now. You can go ahead and go. Go there now and hit subscribe, uh, and so we don't don't lose uh, what, when our new shows come out. If you're uh, watching us from somewhere like uh, iTunes or any of the other podcast directories, they all have these rating systems in them where you can go in and leave a little comment and give a rating. But definitely would appreciate if you go out there and, and give us you know, a, a nice rating and a comment that helps us get fi found in all these. I mean, we're, we're getting more and more viewers all the time, and we're getting more and more questions, and we love that. Um, so uh, we need, just need some more help to try to get us the show to grow a little bit. So if you can take a couple minutes and go out and uh, give us a rating and a couple comments out there, that would be definitely appreciated. Um, everything we showed you today will be on the show notes, and that's actually all at techzen.tv. Uh, you can also go to letsmakeit.tv. It takes you to the same place. And uh, every show has a page with notes, and uh, we're getting more, and we're using Fritzing, which we showed you here. Um, 
and we will start putting more of this out there as well with the schematics and the uh, different diagrams and things like that. Uh, the code will all be out there, and the links to the code will be out in the show notes as well uh, at techzen.tv. And uh, if you haven't, if you just found this show and you're interested, if you go to techzen.tv and go to the show page, you can see all the old episodes. This is episode 25. Uh, so we have 24 more great shows prior to this one that you can go out and you can watch as well. All right. Anything and else, if you've Paul? got a question, and if you've got a question, ask. Yeah, the most definitely. questions. Yep, and we're getting more of them. So people are getting much uh, much more comfortable with asking those questions, and we, we love that stuff. Plus, if you have other show ideas, things you want us to do, uh, send those as well. I got, we got a good one this week with uh, some requests or ideas for future shows, and uh, we definitely love that input. It's great. That's right. Anything else, Bob? I think that's it for tonight. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. For show notes for this show, contacts, and more, go to the techzen.tv website where you can get show notes for all of our shows. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners. We have an email, a Twitter, and a phone number where you can contact us for each show. For details, visit the techzen.tv website and get the show details. You can also make a video and upload it somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo and then just send us a link. You never know, you may see your video in a future show. You can get all of our shows delivered automatically to your favorite device by going to your favorite podcast website like iTunes and subscribing. Each of our shows also has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to to get regular updates. Our shows are also available on most internet radio networks like Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also watch and listen to our shows on Xbox, TiVo, and Roku. You can even find us on your Zoom.